Greetings. My name is Brian King, and I'm one of the elders here at the University City Seventh-day Adventist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. We thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel. This is one way our local church family and guests connect for our weekly church services, which are available each Sabbath at 11 a.m., or you can view later in the day or even later in the week. We have various Sabbath school options for adults and children of all ages. And if you'd like to receive more information, please refer to the weekly church newsletter. If you would like to be added to our newsletter email distribution, please reach out to our church secretary at secretary at ucsda.org. And here is a little information just for you. If you're not yet a member of our local University City Seventh-day Adventist Church, I would like to ask what is standing in your way? Why put off tomorrow what you can accomplish today? Since the future is uncertain, shouldn't we put our faith in Jesus who is always steadfast. Just last Sabbath afternoon, we had a special baptism service at our church. What a blessing when someone joins our church through baptism or transfer or profession of faith. There is no reason to wait if you hear God calling on your heart. Maybe he's tugging at your heart. Maybe today is the day that you need to take that next step. If you're interested in being part of our church family, and want to make it official with your baptism, membership transfer, or profession of faith, please reach out to Pastor Ryan for next steps. May God bless you richly. Today is a special day for our nation because it's the day our founding leaders declared separation from Britain and King George III to become free, united, and independent states. From our history book, we recall these famous and timeless words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. While that quote sounds like something from the Bible, it's actually a quote from the Declaration of Independence, which was finalized on July 4th, 1776, 244 years ago. Written long ago, this is an aspirational quote that is a country we are still continuing to work to fulfill. Jesus is our creator, and he does create us equally. With Jesus as our God, we can experience eternal life, liberty from sin, and find happiness as we unite together with others to worship him. A few announcements to share. We do have a variety of VBS programming and Bible studies available for our church family. Details are in the church newsletter, and I encourage you to get involved. As we move to our offering time, I'd like to refer you to our church website, ucsda.org forward slash giving, for information on how to give during this time of social distancing. If you've typically given in the offering plate at church, join your church family in giving online and returning a small portion of what is already his. You can easily give from your computer or download the app from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store for your phone or tablet. The focus for our loose offering this week is our local church budget. And during this time of social distancing, the church is still paying our mortgage, insurance, utilities, and other related expenses. Please consider how you can support your local church and remember our local church budget as you give. Let us have an opening prayer for our church service and for our offering as we begin our program today. Dear Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to come together. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Lord, we ask for two key things in our prayer to you today. First, Lord, I ask for your blessing and your coverage on all those in our church family, Lord. We ask that you forgive us where we fail you and where we fail each other, Lord and that you work to create bridges and bonds between us, Lord, to bring us closer together and to bring us to unity. Lord, I thank you for our church family and all the many nationalities and ethnicities that are represented, just like it will be in heaven. Lord, I also ask that you pray for our country, Lord. We thank you for the July 4th celebration and the independence that our forefathers granted us long ago to be from underneath England and underneath the oppression of King George III. Lord, I ask now that you continue to work on our country, to continue to work on the healing 
and the corrective actions that are needed, Lord, and to bring us all one to you, Lord, that we shall represent you and your character in all things that we do. In your heavenly name I pray. Amen. Many years ago, God decided that he would have to destroy the world he created. For the people that were living there were doing horrid things, but God found favor in one man named Noah. This is him. See? Ah, what a wonderful day the Lord has made. The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I have found favor with you and your family. <clears throat> Noah, we didn't have that back then. When the ark was finally complete, God sent two of every kind of animal, male and female, to the ark. Two of every kind of every animal, male and female, God brought them. Noah helped, but it was a really great thing that he didn't have to go find them and individually put them on the ship himself. When every animal was safely on the ship, Noah... God shut the door behind them, and they were sealed inside. What? It was hard. for God to send the rain. Let it rain! Critics thought that Noah had completely lost his mind. days and 40 nights, and all the while, Noah and his family were safe aboard the ark, and safe from the terrible flood that had completely covered the world. After it stopped raining, Noah began to wonder if there was any dry land, so he released a raven over the side of the boat. If the raven was to return, that meant that it had f never found a place to rest. But if it didn't, it meant that it had found a new place to live, and Noah could soon resume normal life. For those who may be worrying, the chicken, I mean raven, only fell like three feet. Well, guess what happened? The Can raven came back, so Noah had to try again with a dove. Goodbye, my friend. Fly! Go find land. I hope you can swim. What do you have for me, Bubby? Oh, an olive leaf. How thoughtful. This must mean land is nearby. Good boy. The next time he sent the dove out, it did not return, which meant that it had found land. Eventually, Noah and his family came to rest at the top of a mountain, and he was able to release all the animals back into their natural habitats. story teach us? Well, it teaches us that God cares. God cared about Noah, and though it took a very long time for Noah to build the ship, he obeyed. And because he obeyed, because he was so faithful to God, he got a second chance. Noah got a second chance. He got to start over again, and you can start over again too. I hope you enjoyed watching this movie just as much as we enjoyed making it. Have a blessed day.
Waking up knowing there's a reason All my dreams come alive Life is for living with you I made my decision Sabbath and happy 4th of July. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke chapter 4. Two incidents that happen on the Sabbath day. The first happens in Nazareth. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The next passage comes a few verses later. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What is it, this teaching? 
With authority and power, he gives orders to evil spirits, and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. This is God's word. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we thank you for this Sabbath. We thank you for our nation and this Independence Day that we celebrate. And we thank you most of all for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please help us to think clearly about some important matters this morning. In the name of Jesus we ask, amen. So it's Sabbath and it's 4th of July, and I'm going to try to bring these two things together in one sermon. Uh, how am I going to do that? Well, the passage, if you were paying attention, had some interesting themes. When Jesus announces his mission, um, as he's in the synagogue on Nazareth, he reads from Isaiah, and he reads a passage about freedom for prisoners and setting the oppressed people free. This is a mission that very much lines up with um, our ideals as Americans and what our country stands for. We are a country that believes in freedom. The Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We are a nation that opposes tyranny. We are a nation that was set up, that, that broke free from Great Britain because we said we we believe that God has, has given us the right as a people to, to self-govern and to have freedom. Uh, this is what we stand for. This is what America is all about. And it very much lines up with the declaration that Jesus makes right here in Nazareth. Now, it's Sabbath. Now, this doesn't always happen that July 4 falls on Sabbath, but this year it does. And um, these incidents happened on Sabbath with Jesus. Often we find Jesus doing things on Sabbath, and often he's doing things that, that create controversy because he's doing things that the religious leaders of his day did not agree should be done on Sabbath. Seven times in the Gospels, he heals, and those are controversial because that's working on Sabbath. But Jesus is making a point. He's saying, this is core to my mission, and Sabbath is meant to be a day of liberation, a day of healing. Uh, some of these healings, like this one with the demon-possessed man, you know, they kind of arise in the moment. This guy jumps up in the middle of synagogue service and Jesus heals him. I mean, it would have been weird not to, not, for the Son of God not to take action in that moment. But we also have instances of Sabbath healings where Jesus apparently goes out of his way and purposely heals on the Sabbath. The Gospel of John tells us that there was a paralytic, paralyzed, couldn't walk, for 38 years he's been in this condition. He's been lying for the previous however many years, um, next to the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem, just hoping that he can get better. Jesus could have gone the day before. He could have gone the day after. But he picked Sabbath, and he went and healed this man, gave him back the full use of his legs on Sabbath, I believe in order to illustrate the point that Sabbath is meant to be a day of liberation and freedom. So, it's Independence Day. It's Sabbath, a day that is all about independence. Now, as we think about this great nation and all that it stands for, this nation that I love, especially in this season that we're going through right now, we, we have to recognize the fact that America has not, has never lived up to all that it claims to stand for. We've said that we are a nation that believes that all men are created equal, and yet we have certainly not acted that way. Interestingly, our Adventist pioneers... Um, they saw this so clearly, wrote about it so forcefully. Uh, J. N. Andrews, who Andrews University is named after him, Andrews University being the flagship Seventh-day Adventist institution of higher learning. Um, Andrews was the first foreign missionary for the Adventist church. He was a scholar. He was the third uh, president of the General Conference. And he wrote about Bible prophecy. Now, you have to understand, Seventh-day Adventists, we are a people who, who our identity is grounded in the Bible and specifically in Bible prophecy. We, we believe Jesus is coming soon, and the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation point to the unfolding of, of events leading up to the Second Coming and beyond. So our Adventist pioneers had a lot to say about Bible prophecy and interpretation of Bible prophecy. And the Adventist pioneers looked in particular at Revelation chapter 13 
And they, they saw there the two-horned beast in Revelation 13 as a symbol of the United States. The United States in Bible prophecy. And here's what Andrews had to say. This, this two-horned beast in Revelation 13 that uh, looks in many ways like a lamb or the lamb, the lamb in the book of Revelation is Jesus. So this is, this is a, a, a beast power, a nation that looks very much like Jesus, claims to have the mission of Jesus, uh, believes in freedom, believes in liberty, believes in equality, just like Jesus does. But this beast actually turns out to be like the dragon, the devil himself. Listen to what Andrews wrote. This animal has a dragon heart. His disposition, his motives, his intentions and desires are all like a dragon. His outward appearance is, his horns are lamb-like. In appearance, he's like a harmless lamb. But when he raises his voice in acts of authority, his dragon-like character is revealed. This is a two-faced, hypocritical beast that first appears with mildness and equity, but has the fierce prompting of a dragon heart. The institution of slavery most clearly reveals the dragon spirit of this hypocritical nation. Andrews wrote that in 1857, before slavery had been abolished in this country. The institution of slavery most clearly reveals the dragon spirit of this hypocritical nation. Now what's interesting about this is that our Adventist pioneers have seen from the beginning that the United States, as great and wonderful as it is, has a dragon heart. Not that it evolved from something wonderful into a beast with a dragon heart, no. But that the United States has had a dragon heart from the start. That slavery revealed that dragon heart. But part of our under Adventist understanding of prophecy and of the United States is that dragon heart has not gone away. And we see this as we look at history. Yes, slavery was abolished, but then the sharecropper system kept black freed slaves uh, in bondage still. Jim Crow laws did the same thing. And still, in, in our present day, we face a situation where a lot has changed. Um, there are so many more freedoms granted to black people in this country, but there is still not full equity and equality. This, this nation is still a hypocritical beast with a dragon heart. Now, it pains me to say this because I love my country. Um, I am a proud American, glad to be, be belong to this country. I think American is, America is the greatest nation on earth, and, and I believe in so much of what this nation stands for. But I have to step back realistically and look at the fact that um, we have reason to be pessimistic about America. And certainly the Adventist view is a pessimistic view. It sees America as the final empire in Earth's history, an empire that will become extremely oppressive and dangerous, um, and an empire that will fall. No empire on earth lasts forever. So, how can we say this about America? Well, let's look at the facts. Every nation and empire in the history of the world has fallen. Some empires have been better than others. Some nations have been better than others. But all, all, have been sinful inst human institutions. We are all sinners. We have sin as part of our nature, and nations are simply made up of people, and the leaders of nations are sinners. We should not be surprised that all nations throughout history, no matter how great they, they are or have been, that they, are, they deal with corruption. They, they become oppressive. They don't treat everybody fairly. This is pessimistic, yes, but it's also realistic. And... The challenge for us, as we look at this, is, is to not let pessimism lull us into inaction. As if to say, things are going to get worse before they get better, we know that's true, so we might as well just hang on for the ride and pray for the second coming, because that's the only hope. Well, there's truth to that. We are certainly not going to solve all the problems of the world. You know, and, and I, I've heard the, the quote from Jesus bandied around on the internet lately. Jesus said, the poor you will have with you always. And there's sort of a fatalistic way in which that's quoted, like, ah, we probably shouldn't try to help the poor so much because uh, they're going to be around always. But if you look at the actual quote, Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy, 
And the command is, Deuteronomy 15, 11, there will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. In other words, you are going to, over the course of Earth's history and over the course of your life, you are going to work to bring liberty and hope to the oppressed. And you're never going to succeed 100%. But don't let that fact stop you from continuing to do good. Up to your final breath, up to the final moment before Jesus returns, we as a Christian church are supposed to be doing good. We're supposed to be doing the works of Jesus. He, up until his final breath on the cross, was still looking with love at those around him and caring for their needs. You know, his mother's standing there, and he's thinking of her in his final moments of, on the cross. The very ones who are, who are nailing him there, who are oppressing him, he's praying for their forgiveness as he's hanging on the cross. Jesus continues to do good up to his final moments, in his final moments. And this is our call, because right now, we are the body of Christ on earth. The church is the hands and feet of Jesus. If, if, if we just read the mission statement of Jesus, here, here in Luke 4, to preach good news to the poor, proclaim freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, if that's the mission statement of Jesus, it's got to be the mission statement of the church as well. We are to be an organization, a, a body, that is doing good on earth, even though we know we will never fully succeed until Jesus himself comes back. But we're to be working towards that end. Every nation, every human nation on this earth has fallen. None have been perfect. But that hasn't stopped God from judging those nations that were doing a bad job of things. When nations begin to oppress their own people, when they mistreat other nations, God brings messages of judgment. That's, that's what we find throughout the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets. When a nation is doing well, God blesses that nation. As the Proverbs say, Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. These are, these are, this doesn't just apply to a select nation here or there. This is with all nations. Righteousness exalts a nation. A nation that follows the ways of God, even if it doesn't fully acknowledge God, is going to experience some blessings. And a nation that does honor God is going to be blessed all the more. Let's just look at a bit of history. And I have to warn you, there, there, there's going to be a bit of a history lesson here. Let's start with Israel, the nation of Israel. God promised great blessings to that nation as long as they remembered his laws. Deuteronomy 4, Moses reminds them, See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? The laws that God gave, God's very presence with the nation of Israel, was an incredible blessing to the people. And when the people of Israel stayed close to God, they experienced great blessings. There were times of incredible national prosperity, especially under kings like David and Solomon, when, when God's people were truly the head and not the tail. But, sadly, as always happens with nations, um, sin corrupted things. The leaders turned away from God. And that nation, even though it was God's chosen people, that nation fell. And God raised up Babylon. And it, the Bible is really clear about this. The rise of Babylon was not an accident. God calls Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, in a couple of places, my servant. He was a minister on God's behalf to actually bring judgment upon Israel, to carry the people of Israel away. And we read in the book of Daniel about how God worked in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. God was honored through the example of Daniel and others like him within the court of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar came to acknowledge the true God. Uh, and this kingdom of Babylon, though it was an oppressive power, was, was a power that God blessed and was less oppressive as a result of the influence of Daniel, as a result of its king acknowledging the God of heaven. But Babylon didn't last forever. It fell. Medo-Persia took power. And again, we have a leader there, Cyrus, 
who actually allows the captives, the Jews, to return to their home. Long before Cyrus was born, the, uh, the Bible in prophecy named him. Yeah, prophecy in Isaiah calls Cyrus my shepherd and his anointed, God's anointed one. That's actually the word for Messiah. Cyrus was the chosen one, the Messiah that God had foretold in advance would, would free the captives. He's a type of Jesus in, in that way. He frees captives. He lets people go. Medo-Persia was blessed. Cyrus was blessed because he did good and fulfilled God's purposes. But no nation lasts forever, and, and Persia fell. Fast forward a bit, and we come to Rome. And there's much we could say about Rome, but um, suffice it to say that Jesus was born during the time of the Roman Empire. Rome was an oppressive power. Um, there were also a lot of good things about Rome. Um, and we don't have time to get into all the details, pros and cons, but um, let's say this. The Jewish people in the, in the days of Jesus would have loved to have seen the Roman power gone from their land. They would have loved to have self-rule. That didn't happen, though there were revolts from time to time that attempted to make that happen. Jesus didn't get involved in the revolts. Jesus didn't get involved in politics much. He had a few choice things to say every once in a while about Herod, the local king the, who, who ruled on behalf of Rome in that territory. He called him at one point that fox, and that was not a compliment. Um, but Jesus, his ministry, though it was very much about freeing the oppressed, it wasn't directed so much at Rome as it was directed at his own people, freeing the poor and oppressed from the religious system of, of, of the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, and freeing people, of course, from the, from the guilt and the bondage of sin, freeing people from disease. Jesus is all about freedom, but in, in, in his context, he did not get overly political. So, what about us? And, and I'm not quite there yet. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how this applies. But, but let's just note the difference between us and, and Rome. You know, we live in America. We live in a democracy. They didn't. We have the power of the vote. We have a responsibility within a representative democracy for electing our leaders, for having input in, um, in our laws and systems. So, just because Jesus didn't get politically involved doesn't mean that we shouldn't. Now, we have to be careful here, um, as we'll see in recounting some more of the history. So, the early Christian church, again, didn't get politically involved. It's a small minority in, inside of the Roman Empire, and Christians didn't seek to overthrow the government. That wasn't their role. There, there were plenty of injustices in society around them, and they didn't... Um, they didn't march in the streets to, to address injustice. Rome was not a democracy. It, you know, this would not have been effective. But instead, they, they did something far more effective. In following the example of Jesus, they simply began to care for the poor. And Christians became famous for this. In those days, it was really important that you had a decent burial when you died. And so people with families and wealth um, could afford that. But, but it, was, it was difficult sometimes to have a fancy enough funeral. And so people organized together, um, maybe in guilds or clubs, to kind of help support each other uh, in case there was a death. You know, I'll, I'll attend your funeral, I'll help pay some of the expenses, was kind of the agreement in these clubs. And Christians, of course, did this for each other. But what was radical that nobody else did is Christians did this for people outside of their club, right? They, they saw the poor, in, the urban poor in particular, as people in need who, who couldn't have a decent burial, and so Christians would provide that. They cared for the sick. During times of plague, the Christians would stay back in the city. Instead of fleeing the city, they would stay in the city and care for those who were sick and dying, and then they would provide for their, for their burial. This was radical, and it slowly began to shift the entire culture around them to a culture that cares for the poor. The fact that we live in a world today here in, here, here in the West, that cares about what happens to the poor, this is a direct legacy of Christianity. In fact, there's so much, um, because eventually, you know, Christianity does become the religion of the empire. Constantine, the Roman emperor, converts to Christianity. He says, all right, we're going to be Christians. 
And, and there's a lot of bad that came with that. You know, Christianity was never intended to be a religion in, forced upon people, as Constantine did and, and his followers did um, at times. But Christianity nevertheless spread. And, and th th there are some wonderful legacies that come down to us from Christendom. And by Christendom, I mean um, you have nations that are, that are Christian and kind of have Christianity at their foundation. Um, we, we don't even fully appreciate this in the West. Um, we, we take some of these things for granted, but our society has been shaped by Christianity. I mean, somewhat silly, innocuous things, but, but yet things we, we, we really appreciate, like the fact that we have a two-day weekend that comes to us from, from Christianity. The idea that rulers are not above the law, but that God himself who, who created the laws, is, is reign supreme, and, and that no king has ultimate power, but, but you know, must be subject to the law. That, these are Christian ideas. The idea that civilization is something larger than any one nation, and just because a nation falls doesn't mean that civilization dies. These are legacies that, that come down to us. Ideas like the value of the individual, the, the, the right of each individual to freedom of conscience, um, the importance of literacy, all of these come to us through Christianity, and, and those ideas in particular come to us out of the Protestant Reformation. But there's something powerful about um, the nations of Western Europe throughout Christendom and, and beyond after the Protestant Reformation, because Christianity provided a foundation and framework for social reform, so that when things weren't going right, and let me tell you, things were not always going right. What did I say earlier? Sin lies at the heart of all of us, and it infects our institutions. And yeah, they, they persecuted heretics, and there were wars of religion, and there were terrible abuses and oppressions and corruption in high places um, in the so-called Christian nations. But what was still wonderful during these times is that there's this agreed-upon framework that, that God is sovereign, and that his word matters, and, and therefore, when reforms are needed, you can have a prophetic voice rise up and call a people back to God and back to the Bible. You can even call a ruler to account for his abuses based on the word of God. And you have a whole nation. that, that, that The conscience of a nation can be awakened because there is this framework that, that the people largely agree upon, that the word of God matters, that God is sovereign. We see this um, moving forward through time when we come to the first and second great awakenings. So these would be 1700s, 1800s. These are religious revivals that happened primarily in Great Britain and in America. So you have preachers like um, Whitfield and Wesley and others who are preaching to large crowds all over the place um, across the Atlantic. And, and people are coming to faith in Christ. People are renewing their their faith in Christ. Religion is no longer something um, formal and dry, but, but it's living within the hearts of people. And this is actually the start of evangelicalism. The evangelical movement begins in the 1700s with, with the first Great Awakening. And you have, have these preachers calling so-called Christian societies that aren't living up to their, their ideals, calling them back to what really matters. And so you have reform, um, the reform of society, going hand in hand with religious revival during this time. It's interesting because um, one of the major historians of evangelicalism um, is David Bebbington, a, um, a British um, historian. And Bebbington suggests that evangelicalism can be defined by four key characteristics. One, conversionism. The idea that you must be born again. You know, each person needs a personal experience. Just because you're born into a Christian family, a Christian nation, doesn't make you a Christian. You've got to have that personal faith. Second, Biblicism. The idea that the Bible is important. This is, this is our rule of faith and practice. It's the inspired word of God. Third, crucicentrism. The idea that the cross of Christ is, is really this pivotal moment on which not only Earth's history, but the history of the universe swings. That, that Christ obtained atonement for us, the forgiveness of our sins on the cross. This, this is a central tenet of um, evangelical faith. And finally, fourth, is activism. Now this may come a bit as a surprise to us because we have this concept of evangelicals as, as people who um, 
aren't all that active and engaged, well, Maybe you do have a picture of evangelicals. There, there's kind of this caricature of evangelicals as people. The only activism evangelicals do nowadays is to rail against uh, the evils of, of things that they oppose. And they're not very helpful to the rest of society. This was not the case back in the 17 and 1800s. Evangelicals were activists. Um, and if you think about it, if, if, you, if you study this, it's, it's powerful to realize what happened. Um, foreign missions really took off as a result of the First and Second Great Awakening. So you have William Carey going to India, and you have, after William Carey, you have just scores of Protestant missionaries going around the world, um, evangelizing, carrying the gospel. But they're not just preaching. They're establishing hospitals and schools. They're working for the upbuilding of people. They're seeking to care for the poor. And, and in um, Britain and in America, you have social reformers addressing major problems of the day. They're addri addressing issues like drunkenness, they're addressing issues like slavery. They're, they're saying we need, we need to be educating people. And so you have the idea of public education coming along. All of these reforms are driven actually by Christians, evangelicals, who are putting their faith into action. And part of what's driving this is a belief. It, it's a very optimistic belief. The belief that um, God is at work in the world. God transforms lives. And God can change a drunkard and make him into a sober man, can, can make him into a responsible citizen again. God can take an abuser and not just forgive him from his sin, but actually turn him into somebody who does good in the world. And if God can do that for individuals, then God can do that for nations, because nations are simply made up of individuals. And so this is the vision that drives it. There's this idea of personal responsibility, not a fatalism that, that just says, oh, well, we're all sinners. We might as well give up. But no, it says, God is at work in the world. He's at work in your life. Be holy like he is holy. Live a life modeled after God and do good in this world. And they did incredible good. Incredible good. Heroes on both sides of the Atlantic. One of my favorite heroes is um, William Wilberforce uh, in England. He, in some ways and at some times almost single-handedly, brought about the end of the slave trade. Um, it, the fight looked bleak at times, but he hung in there, always motivated by his faith. The movie Amazing Grace tells his story. And eventually, the slave trade came to an end. And we don't, from our day, we don't recognize what the end of slavery, and, and Britain, you know, ended the slave trade, and then almost 30 years later, outlawed slavery itself. In America, um, another several decades went by before slavery was outlawed through the course of a civil war, huge upheaval in society, but driven by abolitionists who were Christians who were putting their faith in action. Um, people like our own Adventist pioneers, J.N. Andrews, who were saying, look, um, America is a hypocritical beast. You know, slavery is wrong. These things happened um, at incredible financial cost to these nations. That's something we don't always talk about or think about. But the, the percentage, and I should have looked this up, I'm not remembering the exact numbers, but it's a significant percentage of GDP for, for the British Empire that's made up of the slave trade. A, an incredible investment of capital, and, and I cringe to even use that word, in human bodies. The, the, the slaves that were owned were an incredible portion of the wealth of the nations and to suddenly free the slaves was to see that capital, as it were, evaporate. To basically bid goodbye to all of that money. And that's how a lot of people looked at it. And the fact that slavery was outlawed in spite of that. You know, rich people don't give up their money easily. They don't let go of their possessions easily. The fact that that happened is, is a miracle and a testimony to the power of God and to Christians who labored relentlessly to awaken the conscience of nations and to make it happen. And it happened. Praise the Lord, it happened. Now, we've got to talk about an alternate system because as all of these reforms are happening, and, and the reforms were incredible, by the way, a generation after Wilberforce in, in Britain, um, 
another social reformer and politician, Antony Ashley Cooper, known as, known as Lord Shaftesbury, um, moved on to the next, um, next stages of social action, as people in America were doing the same. He, he worked to prohibit the employment of women and children in coal mines. He provided care for the insane. That was, that was new and radical. Up to that point, people who were insane were just kind of uh, shut out of society and forgotten about. And so let's care for them. Let's actually provide for them. Let's treat them as human beings. He established a 10-hour day for factory workers. Radical in those times. Outlawed employing young boys as chimney sweeps. And he was an evangelical Christian, deeply motivated by his faith in God. And, and he wrote, No man can persist from the beginning of his life to the end of it in a course of generosity or in a course of virtue unless he is drawing from the fountain of our Lord himself. See, when it comes to motivation for doing good in the world, for seeking justice in this world, it's hard work. There are frequent setbacks. Um, it takes years sometimes. And the only way you are going to have the strength to persist and be consistent and have the kind of love and patience and, and realistic perspective of fighting human sin and still being gracious and all of that, the only way is if you're drawing from the fountain of our Lord himself. Now, right at this same time, there was an alternate system rising up. Karl Marx was beginning to think and write um, and develop the ideas that, that led to socialism and communism, um, or at least to formulate those ideas. I guess some of those ideas were already there. You know, the French Revolution had already taken place. Marx was inspired by the French Revolution. He, he, he wasn't a big fan of the Reign of Terror, but he liked a lot that had happened there. The, the idea that um, the common people, the workers, would rise up and throw off the aristocrats. Um, Karl Marx was inspired by that. And, and that lies at the heart of his ideas about class conflict and the idea that the working class needed to rise up. I mean, he looked at the situations in the factories. Instead of, like Lord Shaftesbury, um, proposing legislation and working within the current system and trying to awaken the conscience of a nation, Marx's solution is revolution. We need to scrap the old and we need to rebuild a society without God in it. Communism is an atheistic philosophy. There should be no God, because um, Marx looked at religion and he saw it as another, yet another oppressive system. And he said, we've got to rebuild. So revolution, revolution is the only way. The people have to take charge and control. Sadly, though Marx was not a fan of the reign of terror in France, the major communist revolutions throughout history since the time of Marx have all been extremely bloody. The, and... I mean, you look at what happened in the Soviet Union. You've got um, Lenin and Stalin and, and talk about a reign of terror and the millions of people who died and, and were killed. Um, and other countries. You look at what happened in Cambodia with Pol Pot, who was, who was inspired by Marx um, and brutally killed the educated people in his country. You know, if, if you wore glasses in Cambodia, you were killed because you were somebody who probably knew how to read and, and you had the, the means to have glasses. And so in, in seeking to raise up a society where the, where, the, where the poor were elevated and the working classes were in charge, they just, they just killed everybody else. Sadly, the economy and, and the, the culture of Cambodia still has not recovered um, from that. Marx does not chart a path forward that works. And yet, oddly enough, the world in which we are living now, kind of a post-Christian world, and America as really kind of a post-Christian nation. Marxism continues to rear its head as, as a solution, as a possible solution. A lot of the ideas being offered right now for how to solve America's ills arise out of a Marxist worldview. They don't necessarily offer a, a coherent recipe for how to carry that out, but, but they call for a dismantling of the social order. I've had a couple of people point out to me, as I've used the phrase Black Lives Matter, that the Black Lives Matter movement is actually a Marxist movement. And sure enough, you go to their website, you read a little bit about their history. They, they are. They, they are not 
um, compatible with Christianity. But you know what? Let's not let Marxism steal the thunder. The phrase Black Lives Matter is a true phrase, a phrase that Christians should say. Let's not let an organization that has Marxist leanings um, rob us of the opportunity to affirm that Black Lives Matter. You know, Karl Marx had a lot of wonderful and idealistic visions. He wanted to free the oppressed. That was his goal. That's the goal of Jesus, too. It's a worthy goal. It's a righteous goal. America says that that's what it stands for. But America has a dragon heart. Marxism, I don't know what it's got. It's got a rotten heart. Jesus really does offer the only hope for us. And so where does that leave us? Praying for the second coming? Absolutely. But also, what does it mean for America right now? What does it mean for us as, as we think of the oppressed around us? It means that like Jesus, like the early Christians, like evangelicals over the last several hundred years, we can work with hope for social change right up to the very end, even though we know it's going to get worse before it gets better. Sadly, sadly, Christians, and I don't have time to go into the history of this, Christians in our own time, and really going back about 100 years or, or a little more, um, Christians have abdicated our role as social reformers. Um, we've kind of given that up. We've backed off from it. We have focused, and part of this is, there's lots of reasons, but one of the reasons is, is an apocalypticism that we Adventists understand very well. I mean, if you believe Jesus is coming back next year, you're probably not going to spend a whole lot of energy on reforming society around you. You're going to be preaching and telling people, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ so you can be saved, so that you can be ready to meet him when he comes back. And, and we've, we've focused on that to the detriment sometimes of the poor and the needy around us. And we need to be doing both. We need to be tell If we truly love people, we need to be telling them, prepare to meet your God. Because he's coming back and it's going to be glorious and good and you want to be there. But we also need to, in love, say, I see your suffering. Let me do something to help you. That's the ministry of Jesus that we should be doing. But sadly, we, we, we haven't done well at that. And Marxists have stepped into that gap and they've looked at the church and they've said the church does not offer the answers. A, a famous uh, song written by Joe Hill in 1911 uh, illustrates this, this concept. This song is called The Preacher and the Slave. And Joe Hill was a Marxist. He, he writes this, Long-haired preachers come out every night, try to tell you what's wrong and what's right, but when asked about how about something to eat, they will answer in voices so sweet. You will eat by and by in that glorious land above the sky. Work and pray, live on hay. You'll get pie in the sky when you die. That's where that phrase, pie in the sky, comes from. From Joe Hill's song, The Preacher and the Slave. Is that the kind of Christianity that we're supposed to be preaching? When people need a, a square meal, we say, Someday in heaven you'll get a square meal. So just believe, put your faith in Jesus. That, that's a bankrupt faith. You know, the book of James in the, in the New Testament tells us that's not true faith. Faith must work. Faith doesn't just say, I wish you well to the poor. Faith steps in and does something to help the poor. We've got to do both. We've got to preach the gospel that Jesus is coming soon, but we've also got to preach and live the gospel that Jesus came to serve the poor. Now, let, let's think about this in closing. And I know I've preached long today. Important subject. As Adventists, and, and I'm coming back around to the fact that Jesus healed on the Sabbath. We have in the Sabbath a really practical way of helping us think about doing good in the world. The Sabbath comes once a week. Every seven days, the Sabbath comes. And the Sabbath is both a memorial of creation as well as something that points us forward towards that eternal Sabbath that we're going to enjoy once Jesus sets up his kingdom, when there will be rest for the universe and all will be, all will be right. Creation was perfect and beautiful and there was rest. Someday that will be restored. In the meantime, Sabbath is a pointer, a reminder. And think about what happens on Sabbath. The command is not only for us to rest, but for us to give rest 
to those who work for us, even our animals, so that there's total equality. Sabbath is a day of equality. It's a day in which oppressors, if they are oppressing, if capital, if the capitalists might be tempted to abuse their workers and work them 16 hours a day, seven days a week, Sabbath says no, no, don't do that. Sabbath is a break from the, the temptation to human greed, the, the mad dash that we all find ourselves in. It's a reminder in Deuteronomy 5, the Sabbath commandment reads to Israel, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Remember that you were slaves and you were liberated. Therefore, keep the Sabbath in such a way that you are not oppressing other people. Give freedom. That's why Jesus healed on the Sabbath. So while we wait, and here's the tension we live in, you know. No, we're not going to fix all the problems of the world until Jesus comes back. But we don't wait for Jesus to come back and fix all the problems. We are to be active in fixing problems now while we are also working towards his second coming. We are to be, as it were, the moments of Sabbath in this world. Yes, the eternal Sabbath is coming, but in the here and now, Sabbath should happen every week. And there should be Christians who are working every week, not just on Sabbath, but working to do good in this world. How do we do this? It's because of Jesus. It's his example. He's our Lord. And he, we, we think about all of the needs around us. And, and it's overwhelming. It, it's impossible. Jesus, he provides the resources that we need to do this kind of work. Because we cannot do it. But, but he comes to us. He comes to us and he says, I have the riches of heaven. I have the riches of heaven. But for your sake, I will become poor. Because you are poor. I will become poor so that you can be made rich. Jesus says, I see you dying there in your, in your sickness and your sin. I am coming to die so that you can live. This, my friends, is the essence of the gospel. Jesus lays down his life for you and for me. He lays down his life for the poor. And that's all of us. And then Jesus rises to life again, victorious. But before new life comes, there is the cross. Jesus gives everything for us. And then he calls us, in light of the cross and the resurrection, to live empowered lives. To live knowing the end of the story. Yes, America will fall, but there's a better kingdom coming. And because we know how the story ends, because we know that it's not hopeless, we don't have to be pessimistic, all the wrongs will be made right, Therefore, we can go out and work with joy, with confidence. We can work in partnership with God. We can seek to arouse the, uh, arouse the conscience of a nation to do good, to make reforms, to bring changes. We can vote. We, we can march in the streets. We, we can lobby for better laws. And most importantly, we can love our neighbors well because Jesus loves us well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our incredible Savior. Thank you for the resources he provides to help us in our own lives and as we go out into the world to fight injustice, to seek to raise up those that are oppressed, to truly love and care for the poor and needy. Help us, Lord, to take up the work of Jesus. In his name we ask, amen. And now, saints of God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.